Christ the crucified From your hands, your feet, your side Jesus, I trust in you I'd like to talk to you today about disciplining your children for their good. And the uh, first thing I usually have to say when I talk on this, it's been a long time, but um, that there's no condemnation for raising your children in times of your ignorance or, and or your unregeneration. In other words, before you were saved. God is sovereign over when you get saved, and even when you get wisdom. You know, James 4 and 17 says, To him, therefore, that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not to him, it is sin. If you don't know, you're covered under the blood after you get saved, right? Uh, John 6 and 44 says, No man can come unto me except the Father that sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So, you, you couldn't have come to the Lord before you did. He drew you. He put it in your heart to come, and you came. Because he says in John 15, You did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, and that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it unto you. That's also a pretty good verse there for your children. Whatever you ask them, him for, you pray to him for, put your faith in him for, he's going to be able to do it. Um, much of what I have to say uh, has to do with God as our Father and we as parents when it comes to disciplined children. Hebrews 12, verse 7 says, It is for chastening that you endure. God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father chastens not? It is for chastening that you endure. You know, uh, God deals with us as sons. The chastening proves that, that he is our father and that he is delivering it. Because he goes on to say in verse 8, But if you are without chastening whereof all have been made partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we had the fathers of our flesh to chasten us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Yes, and live. For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed good unto them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness." And all chastening seemed, seemeth for the present to be not joyous but grievous, and yet afterward it yields peaceable fruit unto them that have been exercised thereby, even the fruit of righteousness. <clears throat> Nobody enjoys uh, chastening, whether they're on the giving end or the receiving end, you know. And, of course, God's the same way. He's a good father. He knows exactly what we need. And um, we, we shouldn't be, as they say, kicking against the pricks because the Lord knows what we need. We also have a right uh, to Him bearing the curse if we're walking by faith in Him. If we're all repented up, confessed up of our sins, and we walk by faith in Him, we have a right that that, that curse was put upon our Lord Jesus. In Deuteronomy 21, um, 18 through 21, it says, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son that will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they chasten him, will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him <clears throat> and bring him out unto the elders of his city and unto the gates of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of this city, This is our son, he is stubborn and rebellious, he will not obey our voice, he is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him to death with stones. So shalt thou put away the evil 
from the midst of thee, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Well, that's the law. You say, that's pretty drastic, David. Well, under the law, maybe not so drastic as you think, because why would God do this? Because grace and deliverance had not come under the law, and the the sin of this son would be passed on to his children in a geometric progression that would fill the earth as we see today. Uh, these people are destroying the earth, each, each other, and the righteous, which brings an even greater curse on them. Uh, a more murderous generation there has never been. And um, Father destroyed the earth at the flood to get rid of the evil seed, or else we would not have made it this far, obviously. I mean, he destroyed the evil seed, the rebels, so on and so forth, because their seed would have geometrically progressed until they covered the earth. And so, and of course, Father always does what's right. You know, it doesn't matter what people think. It matters what God thinks. You know, he started over with four sowers on the ark. And the first thing they did when they got off the ark was to sacrifice the fleshly beast. If we don't do that, if we don't walk the crucified walk, then we're not his. We don't belong to him. we got to lose our life to gain our light. And um, according to Jesus... We have grace through faith and authority over demons in the New Testament. And it take, we take advantage of every sin. The demons, by the way, take advantage of every sin in us and our children to seek to possess us. And uh, when there is extreme disobedience, uh, deliverance is probably necessary. And it will do much good for the child and ourselves. It would save them many whippings in many cases and a lot of wasted life. If every parent knew that they had authority to cast out demons and did it, the earth would be much better. So every, every parent has authority to do this who belongs to God and has been given this authority through Jesus Christ. Jesus made it possible. You know, he said in Colossians 1 and 13, who delivered us out of the power of darkness. He delivered us. We are not under the power of darkness. Our children are not under the power of darkness. If you walk in willful disobedience, of course you're under the power of darkness because you don't have a sacrifice, right? Uh, and he translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. And Mark 16 and 17 says, And these signs shall accompany them that believe. In my name they shall cast out demons. So that's all you need is, a, is to be a believer, to cast out demons. And, of course, some people don't believe in demons, so they just have to put up with them. But um, a good, healthy portion of Jesus' ministries was casting out demons, and so it was with his disciples and with us, too. So, yeah, you may not recognize them, but that may be your spiritual discernment problem. You know, you maybe need, need to be filled with the Holy Spirit so you can have some discernment about supernatural spiritual things, you know. Luke 9 and 1 says, And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And uh, Luke 10 and 19, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. That's two categories of demons, by the way. And over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall in any wise hurt you. So, their deliverance is through faith. It's through our faith. Believing that these promises are true, that they are for us, that we have authority to do this. And, of course, you can't have faith if, if you're in willful disobedience or rebellion. Faith just leaves. If you've got demons in you, many times faith just leaves, you know. So you need to be clean so you can raise clean children, right? In 1 Corinthians 7 and 14, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified in the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified in the brother. So the believer has a right to sanctify the unbeliever. 
else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. And, of course, he's speaking in faith that we have this authority over these children. Uh, We take this as a promise, right? You know, deliverance gets the demons out. And chastening gives the children motivation to resist them so they don't come back. So these things, these work hand in hand. They, they are both needed and necessary. When we walk in sin, our, our children inherit it. Did you know that? And, and Deuteronomy 5 and 9 says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them. He's talking about idols. Nor serve them. For I... The Lord thy God am a jealous God. Visiting, and that that word there for visiting means to look over or after, to inspect. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the third and upon the fourth generation of them that hate me. Yeah, so obviously we have a right to pass on a clean... um, spirit to our children, clean soul to our children, and all. but those that hate the Lord, um, iniquity is just passed on and on. The fathers pass on their sin nature through their blood to their children. And um, he goes on to say that, and showing loving kindness unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So these two can pass on a righteous life to their children. Uh, a righteous person can pass on a righteous life. A wicked person passes on a wicked life. Uh, even the flesh itself that you've inherited, uh, you've inherited sin there to overcome. And you can overcome it because of the blood of the Lamb, because you have authority over all the demons, and you have authority over the sin through Jesus Christ. So you can overcome. Leviticus 17.11 says, For the life... And that's the same word in Hebrew for soul. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. All right. So uh, the life of the flesh is in the blood. In other words, your flesh has in in the blood the fleshly life, the sin, the sin nature. And it's passed on uh, to your children. Um, You'll notice that many of your children um, have the same problems as you have, you know, and that's because that sin is passed on. But it's also the blood is what's given for atonement for souls. It's the blood that makes atonement by reason of the life. So Jesus' blood gives you his life as an atonement, right? The blood of Jesus, through our faith, breaks the genetic curse passed on from generation to even larger generation uh, from the blood of our parents. And I, like I said, it's a geometric progression. It does, you don't have to go very far till it's extreme. There are more Christians living on the earth today than there ever has been in all of history put together. That's uh, amazing. Well, that's how geometric regression works. Now you see why uh, sometimes the Lord uh, did away with people so that their sin did not corrupt the whole earth. And, and their sin would have corrupted millions of people, you know, and billions of people. Isaiah 65 and 6, I will recompense unto their bosom your own iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together. Why is that? And this is because the fathers' iniquities are passed on to the children and are in the children and in their blood. That's why he's recompensing it together. He's not chastening the father here. He's chastening what is in the son, right? And saith the Lord that I have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I first measure their work into their bosom. Some people see this as a contradiction, but really shouldn't. It's Deuteronomy 24 and 16. 
The fathers shall not be put to death for the children. Neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Well, this is just true, but it doesn't negate what was just stated at all. Still, the sin nature is passed on to them from the fathers. Okay, each man is put to death for his own sin, but he still received it from his fathers. For some people, some people believe these two are contradictory. They're not, not at all. And there's another way to keep the child from becoming rebellious. Uh, repentance and faith in the promises. Proverbs 22 and 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. But the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Now, these are awesome promises, aren't they? Uh, um, if you train them up the way they should go, they won't depart from it. That's the word of the Lord given to his people. And the rod of correction shall drive foolishness out of a child. I know people who put up with the rod, the uh, foolishness in the child. But it's because they're not being diligent to discipline. Um, even a strong-willed child will resist those feelings if you correctly discipline them with love, right? Now you know why children end up in jail or dead or destroy themselves, giving in to their flesh. Um, these awesome promises of correction uh, is for their future, right? Proverbs 13 and 24 says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son. I, I believe the word of God, saints. You can say what you want, but the word of God is true. If you spare the rod, you hate your son. But he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Weak parents want to spare themselves and their children the pain, but this is the way to destroy them. And you, like Eli, who did not chasten his sons, um, they all died and were lost. And, you know, Hebrews 12 and 11 says, All chastening seems for the present to be not joyous, but grievous. Yeah, nobody wants to chasten their child. We do it because we love them and we don't want to destroy them. We don't want the demons to use them. They've got to have a motivation to resist the devil. And if it's not love, fear is good enough, just so they resist the devil. It's the beginning of wisdom anyway, right? So all chastening seems for the present to be not joyous but grievous, yet afterward it yieldeth peaceable fruit unto them that have been exercised thereby, even the fruit of righteousness. Amen. We must not get discouraged when parents or the Lord chasten us because this proves their love. In Hebrews 12 and 5, And you have forgotten exhortation which reasoneth with you as with sons. My son, regard not lightly the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art reproved of him. For whom the Lord loveth he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Amen. So, he chastens all of his children to make sure. And we should do the same thing to make sure. There are children, of course, that hardly ever need chastening. Even a look is enough some, for some kids. You know, they're just, they're just that way. Uh, others, they, they take more chastening than others to, to have to be, resist whatever spirits they are opening up themselves up to. So, uh, in Ephesians 6 and 2, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth now the, the obvious the threat is obvious that if you don't honor your father and mother who have to put up with you all you know uh, all of your young life and and uh, do a lot of suffering for you uh, and you don't honor them the lord is saying your life is going to be shortened 
And um, 6 and 1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Amen. Proverbs 30 and 17. The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. Now that don't sound good. <laughs> that sounds like a threat to me. <laughs> Proverbs 13 and 1. A wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scoffer heareth not rebuke. Yep, there are scoffers out there um, that don't like correction, will not take rebuke. They just get angry with you, which is a very foolish thing to do. Not a wise son. We need correction. We need chastening. Proverbs 19 and 18. Chasten thy son, seeing that there is hope. Set not thy heart on his destruction. Now, he's obviously saying you're going to destroy him if you do not chasten him. The child must have a, a reason to resist the devil, or they will bring him into your house and theirs when they're older. Parents are, are ruled by demons in their children many times, and an open door for demons to come in into themselves. If the parents don't chasten, God will, and his spankings are hard, and sometimes they last a lifetime. Uh, so do your children a favor. You do the chastening. You be a steward for God. You do the chastening. You say, David, my children are bigger than I am. Well, it's, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> uh, there comes a time when you, you've done what you got to do, and that's you can't do any more, right? Proverbs 23 and 13, uh, withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beat him with the rod, he will not die. Yeah, he might act like it. He might act like he's going to die, but he's not going to die. It's okay. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and of course a rod here could be a stick or a switch or whatever, you know, um, and shalt deliver his soul from Sheol. Okay, so he's saying, if you chasten them, you will deliver him from Sheol. And some say, well, what about the laws about child abuse? Uh, well, the only thing I can say is you need to be wise and weak to the weak, but you still need to obey God. Okay, Acts 5 and 29 says, But Peter and the apostles answered and said, We must obey God rather than men. You say, I'm, I'm afraid I might go to jail. You know, well, maybe you ought to do it more subtly, um, but you still got to do it. You got to do it for their sake. And also... Uh, Chastening without love is, is child abuse. And they will rebel from that, you know. You chasten them because you love them, just like the Father chastens all those that He loves. And so that's the reason you do it. If you don't love them, well, you won't chasten them. You'll just have pity on yourself and let them grow up without any correction. Ephesians 6 and 4 says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but nurture them in the chastening and admonition of the Lord. And Colossians 3 and 21, Fathers, provoke not your children, that they be not discouraged. <clears throat> there are a lot of children that get overcorrection, and it's not loving correction, it's overcorrection, and it brings rejection and frustration into a child. They just can't please you and they know it. So they give up. And that's a bad place for them to be. You are not going to get anywhere with them when they get to that place. So love and reasoning and training with chastening will bring good results. Uh, children should hear these verses too, not just the parents. And they, sh they need to know that without this chastening, they will miss God. In, in every way. So it's good to point these things out to the child. Proverbs 29 and 15 says, 
The rod of reproof giveth wisdom, but a child left to himself causes shame to his mother. And everybody, actually. And verse 17 says, Correct thy son, and he will give thee rest. Yea, he will give delight unto thy soul. Oh, that is so true. I had a strong-willed son, and um, and he, he, to me, he's a great person today. You know, I, I love him. Uh, but it was he took more than the rest uh, to be motivated to resist the thoughts that came into his mind. You know, and we were very consistent with it, and I think God blessed us to be pretty successful there. There's going to be no rest. It says he will give thee rest. There will be no rest to the parent who does not chasten their child. Uh, the demons will run rampant in your house. They will pester you, uh, and they'll do everything to take away your peace and to finally inhabit you. And if they're <clears throat> when a child is willfully rebellious, you know, they always always have to be chastened. You know, God always does chasten His children when this happens. Hebrews 10.26 If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fierceness of fire which shall devour the adversaries. Now we know that little children are more ignorant, and you have to let them slide more, uh, than more grown-up children. That's why it says, if we sin willfully. You know, some don't realize it's sin. You have to point out to them it's sin. You have to show them it's sin. You have to show them it's wrong, and then chasten them. And you can chase them very, very young children, and it will have a very good effect, like nothing else. Because if you're rebelling against the word, the same thing's going to happen with them. Proverbs 20 and 30 says, Stripes that wound cleanse away evil. Stripes that wound. Oh. And strokes reach the innermost parts. In other words, chastening should be according to the measure of the crime, but it should also leave a lasting impression so that they won't want that penalty again. If they learn that this penalty uh, from their earthly parents, they'll understand it when it comes from their heavenly Father. Proverbs 13 and 18, it says, Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuses correction. But he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. So if you teach them to regard and appreciate chastening and reproof, they'll be honored. Proverbs 6 and 23, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Uh, instruction in the Word will train the child why they need to cooperate with God. Uh, 2 Timothy 3 and 16 says, Every scripture inspired of God is also Profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, which is in righteousness. Children need the Scriptures. When you study the Scriptures, be sure and be thinking about your children because you need to teach them the Scriptures. And they've got a, a very quick mind and a very good memory, and uh, they'll remember these things. Proverbs 15 and 5 says, A fool despises his father's correction. But he that regardeth the reproof getteth prudence. So, you know, fools hate correction, which will save the life of the person who gets it. And many times rejection and fear of rejection causes this. They read correction as rejection, and they fear it, and they rebel against it. That's, in many cases, that's because you need to cast those demons out. And, of course, sometimes rebellion and self-will and all the other demons that would like to take advantage of you and your household. Right? Proverbs 12 and 1, Whoso loveth correction, loveth knowledge. 
But he that hateth reproof is brutish or beastly. Some people, you just cannot correct them. It could be that they need that deliverance that we spoke about from rejection and fear of rejection. It could be that they just have a spirit of rebellion, whatever. When you command these things to come out, you know, you, you know, you just have to believe that you have authority to do this, right? Children need a mentor. And they need somebody that they can feel comfortable to talk to and, and gain understanding. Mark 10 and 14 says, But when Jesus saw it, he was moved with indignation. And he said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me. Forbid them not, for to such belongeth the kingdom of God. Amen. We're stewards of our children for God. We must share the gospel with them. Uh, when they're young and impressionable especially, uh, we should also baptize them, etc., etc., and, and teach them the ways of the Lord. Second Corinthians 5 and 20 says, We're ambassadors, therefore, on behalf of Christ, as though God were entreating by us. We beseech you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And uh, Jeremiah 2 and 19 says, Thine own wickedness shall correct thee. Oh, it, it does, you know. I mean, for every rebellion, there's a just recompense of reward, and, and uh, people see that there is a curse on their sin. Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backslidings shall reprove thee. Know, therefore, and see that it is an evil thing and a bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God. And that my fear is not in thee, says the Lord, the Lord of hosts. Okay, so it's true. If a person goes into any kind of rebellion, they don't fear God. If you don't fear God, you don't fear His word. If you don't believe, obey His word, um, well, you're going to reap a very bad harvest in your life. Rebelling against the Lord hurts. It always hurts. And I knew a man who tore up his house because of anger against others who helped him to build it. And then he had to live in it. <laughs> well, you know, the, the Lord, he, a person should be able to get a lesson from that, you know. Um, Acts 26 and 14, uh, And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice saying unto me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for thee to kick against the goad or the pricks. It it hurts when you're rebelling against God and you you uh, strike out at things around you. Let me say this: God is sovereign through everything around you. If you're angry, you're angry at God. He's the one that's doing the chastening. Why are you angry about this or that happening or all these things that come against you? You know, don't be angry with God. That there's no good end to that. Uh, repent quickly. Change your mind. Start thanking God for chastening you and thanking Him for delivering you from the chastening. Right? We have to train children in the fear of the Lord without which they will be blocked from deeper wisdom and obedience. Psalm 34.11 says, Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Amen. Train your children on the fear of the Lord. They need to fear the Lord. One reason you spank them is to help them to know how to fear the Lord. Proverbs 16 and 6. By mercy and truth, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. For all evil that a man does, there is a curse. The demons are waiting to exercise their authority over a person who rebels against the Lord. They have a legal right. You can't take away their right without repentance and faith. They will. They are the tormentors. 
they will torment you. They will t- torment uh, the parents who do not chasten a child. They will torment them. In Psalm 111 and 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, if you if you have to start at the beginning, <laughs> this is it. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You can build on this. If you don't have a fear of the Lord, you're not going to be respectful to His Word, His commands, uh, His chastenings. You won't see them as chastenings. You'll just rebel against that and kick against the pricks, which is very painful, by the way. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. Yeah, they know what's good for them. They know how to create a good future. Don't be deceived whatsoever a man sows, so shall he reap, the Bible says. Meaning you make your own future, right? And his praise endureth forever. Oh, praise be to God. Proverbs 8 and 13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Amen. When you fear the Lord, you hate evil. Because it's destructive to you, it's destructive to your children, it's destructive. Those sins that the parents have are passed on unto the children, right? Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the perverse mouth do I hate, the Lord says. So, lack of the fear of parents and the Lord will shorten the life of children, and it will put them in danger. Proverbs 10 and 27 says, The fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Proverbs 14 and 26, In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. In other words, if you fear the Lord, you can be confident in Him. If our heart condemns us not, we have boldness towards God, right? And his children shall have a place of refuge. Wow, look at that. And his children shall have a place of refuge. The person who fears the Lord, they don't walk in willful disobedience to the Lord. They uh, are respectful and humble towards the Lord. He says his children shall have a place of refuge. Proverbs 14 and 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may depart from the snares of death. The fear of the Lord. You fear what? You fear what the Bible says about God, what God wants, what He doesn't want, what He's warned you not to do. You fear those things and you depart from the snares of death. Children are saved from death, and they stay saved by the fear of the Lord. You know, some some parents feel very guilty that though they did the best they could, their children seem to be going the wrong way. Um, and sometimes this is a spirit of condemnation that's coming to make them have a lack of faith because... Uh, all you got to do is confess, uh, repent of it, turn, and exercise faith. That's what the Lord wants you to do. He doesn't want you to dwell in it. He doesn't, he's not trying to condemn you. He, if you've made a mistake, fine. Uh, get up, study the Word, find out what's right, and do it. And don't worry. Don't think that the Lord has passed you by or your children. You know, uh, trust in the Lord. I have faith for your loved ones. Your faith will work. Just walk by faith for them and not by sight. Believe in your prayers and expect miracles and be patient. And you know, um, he that endureth to the end shall be saved, right? You know, God has a plan for your children. Give some some uh, deep thought to this. It, you know, it'll free you from worry and strife and condemnation and and so on. And, and a lot of self-effort in order to bring about God's will in them. You know, some people are worrying their kids because they're not 
believing God's done it. They're trying to do it themselves. You know, this does not include not chastening your children. Okay, so don't think that. And by the way, that they're going to have to be saved after tribulation and failure of their worldly expectations, just like you were. Children have to go through things. They have to learn things just like you did. You think you can get them out of all that, and you may get them out of some of it because of your wisdom, definitely, but you won't get them out of all of it. And children raised up knowing about the Lord or being in the Christian home are, are sometimes very self-righteous. They either think that they deserve what they have um, and don't really understand grace, or they are tired of the the law being held over their head, you know, and they get rebellious. They also, sometimes the Lord releases children to go into certain sins. Don't worry about it. Still walk by faith because they have to see themselves as sinners in order to be the dirt that the fruit can be born out of, right? You know, God only saves sinners. Some people think they're pretty good and they just accept, but they don't repent because they don't see themselves as sinners. Okay, that's a, a fatal mistake for some. So um, it's a necessary revelation in order to appreciate the great value of the salvation that the Lord has, has uh, procured for us. And, uh, and it is unmerited favor. We don't deserve it. We can't demand it, etc., etc. It is by the grace of God. I remember my oldest daughter when we were in church, and she was about three years old. And um, we would teach her what was right and wrong, but she was kind of pharisaical. <laughs> Little children can be that way. Um, she's going around our our lost friends and relatives sometimes and saying, uh, God don't like that. <laughs> you know? And um, and we told her, uh, but she reflect, deflected, I would say, the responsibility. We uh, felt like she was a little Pharisee, but it was kind of cute. You know? Our father has had many prodigal sons. And uh, just as in Jesus' parable um, the pro of the prodigal son. And it doesn't make him a bad father, and it doesn't necessarily make you a bad father um, if your son rebels. Sometimes the Lord just wants to teach him something, right? Let me read this to you. Luke 15, 11 through 32. And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of, my, of thy substance that falleth unto me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there he wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a, a mighty famine in, the, in that country, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. But when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to, and to spare, and I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was yet afar off, his father saw him and was moved with compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight I am no more worthy to be called thy son. 
But the father said to his servants, Bring forth quickly the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and make merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. And they began to be merry, and now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and, and dancing, and he called to him one of the servants, inquired of what these things might be. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. But he was angry, and would not go in. And his father came out and entreated him. But he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, and I never transgressed a commandment of thine. And yet thou never gavest me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But when this thy son came, who hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou killest for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that is mine is thine. But it was meet to make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. Of course, you can see the major the theme here is that people go astray of God, go into the world, as many, even children that are raised up by the righteous, right? But, like this son, they can be humbled. You know, in this parable, the so-called good son, who, who never left, was self-righteous and judgmental and merciless. But, on the other hand, the younger son, who spent his inheritance on riotous living, realized his low estate and came to his father very humbly. He said, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and in thy sight I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. In other words, the, the once rebellious son now understood mercy and grace and was a much better man for it. Prophetically, the firstborn son who never left the father uh, was the righteous among Israel, but they, they didn't understand grace. And the younger second son of the father who fell away through the dark ages <laughs> for 2,000 years uh, is the church who is returning in these days to understand the grace of God. And of course, on an individual basis, an individual can fall away from God and return. And um, then this fits them very well, too. And what did the Father say? Bring forth quickly the best robe, which is the robe of righteousness, according to Isaiah 61 and 10, and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand, which is a symbol of authority. And maybe of the bride, too, I don't know. And shoes, uh, the walk of separation from the world for his feet, right? The prodigal son will have more of everything than the first son. I mean, we have to understand grace. The Lord wants us to understand grace. He wants us to understand that we have we can't work for it. We don't deserve it. It is God's mercy, right? And those who have been sinners know their need of God. But many times those who are raised as God's people do not. Well, what usually happens is they fall away so that they can get that revelation. Don't worry. Just keep praying and believing for them, right? Matthew twenty one twenty eight says, But what think ye? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, Son, go work today in the vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterwards he repented himself and he went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Which of the two did the will of the Father? They say, The first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. These are the people that all realized they were sinners. But the religious guy thought he was 
righteous, but he was self-righteous, right? Jesus went on to say, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not, but the publicans and the harlots believed him. And you, when you saw it, did not even repent yourself afterwards, that you might believe him. Many times it's just not the son who says he will go to work in the father's vineyard who actually goes, but the son who's first inclination is to not go. You know, many career Christians <laughs> are bored with the work of God and distracted by the world, and the publicans and harlots are so appreciative of a place in the kingdom that they throw their whole heart into running after the Lord and, and seeking out the lost and things like that. Apostle Paul was a pretty good example. He, he was... Uh, a murderer of Christians. And um, he just was so shamed that he, he wanted to redeem himself by the grace of God, you know. I believe that in the last days of the Gentiles, it's going to be the same as it was in the last days of the Jews. There are many self-righteous Christians today who are not the creation that the Father wants. And those of you who have been raised in the church should humble yourselves to the Word of God and not religion, so that no man take your crown. Luke 18 and 9 says, And he spake also this parable unto certain who trusted in themselves that they were righteous, and set all others at naught. Two men went into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as the rest of men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be thou merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, I say unto you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be humbled, but he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And Jesus told the Pharisees that he didn't come to call the righteous, but the sinners. They all considered themselves righteous, right? Romans 11:32 For God has shut up unto uh, shut up all unto disobedience that he might have mercy upon all. And uh, Romans 8 and 20 For the creation was subject to vanity which is the fall and corruption and and sin and so on, you know. Not of its own will by reason of him that is God who subjected it in hope that the creation itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. Praise the Lord. And when they get delivered, they're very appreciative. Don't worry about your children going into sin. God's able to fix that. You just keep believing. Don't walk by sight. Just keep believing, right? And Father, uh, we ask, Lord, that you uh, give grace to um, the parents out there to be better parents. And that you take away any condemnation that might be keeping them from having faith for their children, because that's a sneaky work of the devil. And Father, we just uh, we ask that you give them your gift to be good parents, and that they believe for their children. Jesus said, uh, "All things whatsoever you pray and ask for, believe you received them, and you shall have them." And that includes, of course, that your children would be saved, that they would come into the kingdom, etc. So, Father, we, uh, we thank you for saving our children. We thank you for bringing them through things, um, even in the pig pen, you know, um, that will make them appreciate the salvation that you offer, Lord. And uh, thank you so much, Father. Thank you for your mighty gift of grace and faith for them. Uh, we know that you hear our prayers, and we're not worried, Lord. We know that even the times to come, the hard times to come, are going to bring about their salvations and their deliverance. And they'll be running to the kingdom, running to the king. And we thank you for it, Father. 
In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. My Lord Jesus. Trust in you.